Hi everyone, this is GKCS. Today we are talking about a remote code execution engine. The core problem, the absolute core problem is that you need a job scheduler so that you don't overload your services. You need a container so you don't overload your services and there is security. And that's it. Okay. Okay. So, I watched your video about this system and the question I had was, you know, this system seems to work well for like an evaluation, you know, competition type of situation. But I was wondering like how you would extend it or change it to something like an online IDE where, you know, maybe thousands of people might be using it at the same time and expect like a really fast result. Okay, okay. So. Right. I think I have been thinking in terms of the compared programming environment where we are thinking about getting a accepted or a wrong solution. Um, what we need to focus on is, is the real-time aspect of things. So if someone is running it on their desktop, they send us some code. We want a server. Uh, when we have the code in the server, what we want is a quick response to the user and it feels like you're running this code locally in your own compiler and in your own local machine. So, okay, you're giving me one important thing to look into that is latency. We want low latency for this. We can't probably put it in a batch, like I said, and then we don't want to process these requests periodically. Okay. How do I make this system faster? Um, one of the things that I could do is I could make it a re request response kind of thing. So it's no longer like something that happens in the background and when the results are computed, we don't store it in a database uh, and then also send, you know, every time a result comes in, we don't send a notification to the user because that's slow. Uh, ideally, what we want to do is we want to create a different kind of architecture where a user writes some code, we get it on our server and the server is able to quickly respond back with a yes or no response. Uh, what, what are we looking for exactly? When someone is writing code, they're not actually sending us a file. If it's an online IDE, they are sending us some text uh, and all the other relevant details of the profile maybe can be taken over here, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter much. So I'll just take profile ID. This is the type of request that I'm taking. And if I'm thinking about what is the response or basically the output of the code along with the status. So maybe, maybe the code didn't run. So maybe there's an exception. So you probably want to just take the output of the code uh, in, a, in a more generic way. So let's take output of the code as std out and std error. So these are the two things that we want to send back or we want to send back a timeout. Finally, the kind of system that we can focus on, especially in a system which is looking for a lot of real-time things, is send us your code, which is basically a request with these parameters, right? There is some text, uh, and then you tell us the type of the text also. Is it Python? Is it Java? Is it C++? Um, we then take it on our server. Our server says, okay, here's an acknowledgement that yes, I have received your request, but I don't know the response yet. So on the browser, one of the things that we can do is we can show a reload button or a, not a reload button, but a thinking button. Now this is not great user experience, but uh, that's for the product team to decide. I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll just offshore this problem to them because um, they can probably show an ad or they can show another product or they could just keep the user hanging off the you know, edge by uh, showing them that we are computing your result. Um, in the backend, the server can still use a queue, a task queue. Now, why am I going for this architecture again and again? The reason I want to do this is because I want to isolate the 
the speed at which inputs are coming in, the speed at which requests are coming in, and the local computation power that we have. So if we have a, a box of machines, like th this will be the containers that we talked about, then we can assign this each of these requests to different containers depending on which one is available. So we have a bunch of containers that are already set up um, and then we can assign them to basically these are workers. Okay. So in case we cannot assign them, in case we are full, then we keep taking these requests in queue and the, the time required for the user to see a response, a success or a failure response increases, but that's okay. Uh, we can, in case we have that many users, we can always horizontally scale, which is basically add more servers to this. So it becomes a bigger and a bigger uh, system, but you know, we have more users. So we are assuming we have more money, which means that we can rent out more servers. So things are going good there. Uh, Apart from that, once we have the computation result calculated, which is the standard out and the standard error, we take this, send it back as a response to our server, an event. Uh, this event has details like for this request ID, this was the, this was the response. So, these two details, response, or I shouldn't call it response, I should probably call it result. Yeah. So request ID result uh, gives us the final, final result of uh, this request. The server looks at this request ID. It has a map, let's say, of request IDs to the request body. Okay, all this stuff can also be backed up by a database. I'm not getting into that because um, it will, I mean, for, for the sake of uh, clarity, if I start drawing too many databases, it may uh, be confusing. Even this worker system is something that is actually in a lot more detail. Uh, you can use, you can use a simple architecture where there is a, uh, or, you, or you can use an open source thing like Celery for this. Yeah, right. so Celery is a task assignment system. Uh, and we can use this, it's open source, I think it's on Python. Uh, we can use this to, to get our workers computing results. Finally, when the result comes in as an event, our server looks at the database, says that, okay, for this request ID, this was the, these were the rest of the details. Um, make a response using this result for this request ID, and then we send it back to the user. So in this way, we should be able to get a response as quickly as possible, but of course, nothing is real time. It still depends on the computation power that we have on our server side. In general, I would, Quick question. I mean, if I had to guess how much time is it going to take for a request to be computed? Yes, it depends on how much time it takes for the request to be put into a queue as an event. Uh, it also depends on uh, when this event will be picked up. So we should probably have a time to live in this queue. We, we can, you know, in case it's taken more than 10 seconds to compute, we kick this event out of the queue and tell the user that, sorry, we had a timeout, maybe too much server load. Similarly, over here, we have to take right. care of that, but yeah, uh, over here, yeah. yeah, it should be fine. Uh, in case there is a timeout at any point in time, we need to just give a response that maybe the network was too slow, uh, which, is, which is this point uh, of the request. So if the timestamp that they have sent us the request is T, and we are we get the request at t plus 10 for whatever reason maybe our our network is slow or uh, or maybe the request is is weird i mean why did it take 10 seconds whatever be the case we can just give them a timeout response right uh quick question so with this kind of architecture will it be stateless uh stateless okay so is the server stateless like this thing the the reverse proxy or the gateway, which is talking to requests, I mean, taking requests and giving responses, uh, no. In this case, because we have to map the, the request ID to a request body, we can do two things. One is to, uh, to keep it stateless, but I've kept it stateful. The reason being that then the container uh, doesn't need to know about 
what are the details for this request. It just needs a request ID, it just needs a key, and it gives us a value. But we could make it stateless. I think making it stateless is a good idea because then I don't need a database here to map requests to the request bodies. Why, why do I have this request body in the first place? The reason I have this is because I need to know which user actually sent this request. I guess what I'm thinking, what I'm thinking of is two different cases. One is you have an editor open, you have a file, and then you need to execute it. The other case is if you have, say, a Python interpreter running in the IDE, you need to remember like what you have in that state, right? When you open up an IDE, you, you would expect to see like an editor and maybe the shell and maybe, like, let's say, a Python interpreter, right? OK, so yeah, um, we, we write this stuff down. Yeah. Oh, OK. OK, if it's an interpreter, then on every line, do you want the code to execute? Or do you want the entire code to be, uh, oh, I, I get your point. Yeah, it's not a compiler. It's an interpreter. Yeah. Right, yeah. OK, this is interesting. Yeah. OK, so this is, uh, this is interesting and a little challenging. So the thing is that yeah. if we need to keep the server in the loop, in my understanding, one way to do this uh, is to keep the server, let's say, stateless, in which case our local browser has to remember every single command which has been executed in this, uh, in this browser session. So command one, command two, all of this is actually being locally stored in the browser. And every time we actually execute a command, it's sending all of this yeah. text to the server, which keeps it stateless. Now, one of the reasons why yeah. engineers like it stateless is because you don't need to uh, store state. And whenever you, I mean, whenever engineers store state, the problem is what if the system crashes? So uh, mm -hmm. we executed command one, executed command two, command three did not reach the server or the server uh, lost some state. For some reason, this, this went bad. And command four now, which depends on command three, um, is sent to us, but we executed wrongly. So x equal to three here, yeah. x equal to one. And then we say, give me the value of x. And we get the wrong answer because three did not execute properly. So this is the general mm -hmm. use case why we want things stateless because we get all this info and we get it right every time. But um, I, I think the user experience is not going to be great if they have been in the ID for more than, let's say, 30 minutes writing out some code. Uh, and every time we send them 3,000 lines to the server to compute. OK, so I would definitely yeah. want this yeah. to be yeah, I, I would definitely want this to be stateful then. Where the server mm -hmm. uh, for a particular browser ID, so or rather a browser session, so session ID, profile ID, which is this user in this session has had this code. No, but what if multiple people want to actually code? So we can have a simple session ID and then we can have uh, code till now. So let's say code. So this is a simple key value pair. I'm not sure if we'll need to add more stuff here, but at the moment, uh, every time a person adds code in this session, we go to the session ID. Let's say this is uh, session ID one, two, three. And we have a block of code. If you enter a new line, let's say line number five over here, we just add that yeah. to this. Yeah. Yeah. Now, interestingly, how do you execute it and in real time and as quickly as possible? Like, how do you, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's another interesting part of it. Okay. So firstly, let's, we have kept, we have taken the choice of using a stateful server. The other thing is that do we keep this session alive in the sense that do we actually have a container which is running this code? So every time we add a new line, we don't need to, um, recompute the entire thing. We we just uh, literally run it on this container. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that's that's sort of what I was thinking. I was thinking, why not for each browser session, start a new Linux container and then keep it alive as long as the user is there. Uh, you can add anything to that container, right? Like. If it's a Linux container, you can run you know any Linux commands, and if you just install 
Python, it's going to be able to run Python, whether it's the interpreter or actually the whole file. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. That, that's a really yeah. good idea because this is like a tiny little operating system in itself. So it's got its own, it's got its own like space. So uh, hard disk space. It has, it has network. It has uh, files. That's an interesting idea. I didn't think about this because usually servers are not so stateful, but this is, I think, really useful in this particular case. It makes it really unique. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have a yeah. 256 here, and every time code is being added, you actually have a mirrored container. Wow. Yeah. Okay. yeah. okay. So every time we actually get a new line to this, we add it here. And we run it on this container. The container gives us a response. I mean, it gives us an output, which we take as a response sent back to the user. OK. Yeah, this makes a lot of sense. My, my only concern is that what if the system crashes, in which case all of this state which was mm -hmm. in the server is lost. But we can spin yeah. up these containers again by looking at our persistent storage uh, at our in our database. And then see that okay, we we had code up to this point. We need to build a container, run all of these lines sequentially, and then mm -hmm. finally we'll yeah. have that same state. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A anything else that could yeah. happen? Uh, I think YK. An interesting problem is what if a person has in their code timestamp, and timestamp initially was hundred, and the server crashed, and when it re-executed it, it was timestamp mm -hmm. equal to fifty or five hundred rather. Uh, yeah, this is interesting. Do we store the results also? No, I I, I don't know. Uh, storing the results is a bit right. weird because you can't actually store them onto variables. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is an interesting use case. I think uh, this is the biggest problem with distributed systems. Martin Kleppmann has an interesting solution to this. I think it is it is that. Uh, whatever is dependent on the real world, if you can, then store it at the start of the code execution. So over here, we should be storing uh, all the all the things that can change the state later on, like timestamp could be one of the things. It could be the, um, yeah, time is one factor, which is a, which is a big deal. Uh, apart from that, if there is some state in the server that you want to store right now, uh, you can store it over here in the top. And when then you're spinning up a new container, you have this info which you can replicate here. And that way the timestamps are also fine. Right. So like with, with a system like this, how often do you think these containers will crash? Uh, yeah, before I get to that, I think I was totally wrong in the timestamp thing. Uh, so I'll just remove that. Uh, and we can discuss that in the comments, guys, if you, if you have a better solution. This won't work. Uh, but yeah, uh, how often will this system crash? Okay, if uh, an engineer like me has written the system, then quite often. But otherwise, uh, this should this should be scalable. Um, as you add more users, you add more containers, and so the container side of things, we could have. Uh, so there's quite a few things here. We could have power loss. We could have data corruption. We could have uh, we could have a network partition. As a user, if I'm you know if I'm running my code on an interpreter, if it crashes, I, you know I might need to like redo my work. So. Yes, yes, that's true. So uh, to mitigate that to some extent, we have the database storing our code. But uh, in case there's a crash and we tell the user, please wait for ten seconds, that's not a great user experience, especially when they're in the middle of coding. So what we would like to do then is whenever a container crashes, we need to know about it as quickly as possible. Maybe not when the user is writing code. So uh, one of the things that we can do is all of the containers actually send us their health status every now and then. So there's a health service which checks whether a container is alive or not. So it keeps pinging it on slash health. This is an API that we can expose. Right. And um, every time it says, yes, I'm alive, this is good. In case it doesn't say it's alive, then we can either recreate it because spinning up a new container is actually quite cheap, uh, or we can wait for two health checks to fail before we uh, spin it up again. 
um, when right. we when we are spinning it up that time we have to actually tell the session id that hey your new container uh, i mean this is the data but also there's a corresponding container so there has to be some sort of a pointer here uh, to this container address so that has to change here um yeah mm -hmm. yeah it makes sense mm -hmm. so the the service which is taking care of this thing here it has to be notified by the health service that hey one of the containers just died so and that container id was this so then it can spin up a new container for itself yeah right okay um and the moment the container spin up uh, i mean then we are good i don't uh, think that we should have multiple containers running the same code because that will be very expensive yeah that will be pretty expensive um in case i mean in case let's say the users in india have a server crash we don't want people in the us to suffer the same thing or or maybe it's not country dependent at all it's more like user dependent so uh, one of the things that we can do is we can have users um coming in here like different types of users let's say user id 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 so uh, users from 1 to 200 are served uh, by servers in this region users from 200 to 400 are served in this region uh, and users from 400 to greater are served in this region so 400 to greater is this uh, and we have the blue guy over here 1 2 3 coming here so different servers exist in every region uh, and if one of the server crashes then at least some of the server, uh, users are still being served that is that is uh, something that we can do it's horizontal partitioning yeah yeah i think kind of related to that i have sort of a general question for you um so let's say we have 5000 concurrent users at maximum then we we need at least 5000 containers right yes that's uh, that's a bit of a problem like how do we scale it hmm well can we possibly run the same code on i mean uh, uh, different types of code on the same container yeah it should be possible yeah 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 why not actually we could uh, we could create a virtual machine or a container like we don't need to create a container for every user we could uh, if there is okay so that changes our architecture a bit let's let's look into that um that's a do you think do you think making a container for every user is too expensive i'm not sure honestly i i haven't actually um i would like to see some data around what is the uh, how many users are there and then based on that making a decision but uh yeah if let's say we have too many users which is eventually going to happen as replicate scales uh what's mm -hmm. going to happen is spinning up containers is going to become a bit of a bottleneck Uh, and the health service checking all of these containers for the health is again a very expensive proposition because if we have 5000 uh, requests going every 5 seconds this health service can yeah. become distributed yes but uh, it's not yeah it's not ideal so what we can do then is each yeah. container so multiple uh, multiple sessions let's say 4 5 6 are mapped to the same container what ends up happening here is that this container is responsible for running code from 256 and 456 um and so it has it has a uh, different processes running different pieces of code so we might have java mm -hmm. running here and python right. running here yeah yeah right uh, we could mm -hmm. also say that okay fine because uh, maybe all of the java code or we have 100 containers for java 100 containers for python mm -hmm. and so on and then we can split the users based on that which actually helps again yeah. like